Good afternoon. The National Religious Campaign Against Torture is pleased to welcome all of you, lots of you, to this webinar on solitary confinement in an age of mass incarceration. Um, I'm Rich Kilmer, the NERCAT's Executive Director, and it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator for today's webinar, Laura Markle Downton. Laura is NERCAT's Director of U.S. Prisons Policy and Program. Laura joined our staff in January and has done a fantastic job. We are pleased to have her on staff and working with many of you in efforts to end prolonged solitary confinement in U.S. prisons. Laura? Thanks very much. Welcome to everyone in this hour-long Nearcat webinar. We will hear from leading policy experts with an overview of legislative efforts to end prolonged solitary confinement. We will be hearing stories of surviving solitary confinement and from members of the faith community who are engaged in efforts to end this destructive practice. The webinar today will include information about causes of the dramatic expansion of the use of solitary confinement in the context of mass incarceration, a description of recent reform successes, and future opportunities for members of the faith community to be engaged. So thanks so much for joining us. Our speakers today include Amy Fedig, Senior Staff Counsel for the ACLU's National Prison Project, which is dedicated to ensuring that our nation's prisons, jails, and other places of detention comply with the Constitution, domestic law, and the international human rights principles, and to ending the policies that have given the U.S. the highest incarceration rate in the world. We're also so glad to be joined by Mr. Anthony Graves, founder of Anthony Believes, who will share from his own experience of surviving 16 years in solitary confinement in Texas before his conviction was overturned. Mr. Graves presented powerful testimony at the 2012 congressional hearing on the realities of solitary confinement experienced each and every day in US prisons. We'll also be joined by Emily Tucker, Director of Policy and Advocacy for the Detention Watch Network, which works through the collective strength and diversity of its members to expose and challenge the injustices of the US immigration detention and deportation system and advocates for profound change that promotes the rights and dignity of all persons. I want to encourage you to note that throughout the webinar you will have the opportunity to submit questions to be placed in the queue for answering during the question and answer segment at the close of the webinar today. Any questions we're unable to address during the we webinar due to time, we'll do our best to address through email correspondence with you. To pose a question for any of the speakers, uh, write your question in the question chat box on your screen. And so with that, let's turn to our first presenter, Amy Fedig of the ACLU. Thank you so much, Laura. I'm so pleased to be here today. And I am especially excited that NERCAT has convened this important webinar for the faith community because the, the faith community has really played a critical role uh, in local and national efforts to reform solitary confinement in this country. And I want to say NERCAT in particular has been a pivotal leader in successful reform efforts that we've seen all over the country. And so I am going to start my presentation today to talk about solitary confinement as it's, as it's generally practiced in the United States, what happens to men, women, and all too often kids in solitary confinement, how their rights are impacted, their lives, their communities, and us. And most of all, I want everyone to remember here that this is not inevitable. You see up on your screen uh, some serious facts and figures about 80,000 people being in solitary confinement in the United States. But I want you to know that it didn't used to be that way. Solitary confinement, as we see it now today, is a product of deliberate policy decisions, financial, and legal decisions. It's not inevitable. It's not irreversible. And in fact, 3 or 40 years ago, I probably wouldn't be here talking to you about solitary confinement. It simply wasn't a pervasive practice. But unfortunately now, the United States is the greatest user and abuser of solitary confinement anywhere in the world. We have 
Entire prisons called supermaxes that were built with the sole purpose of placing all individuals in solitary confinement. And there are about 25,000 people on any given day in, in those facilities in the United States. Uh, but even more than that, solitary confinement is practices beyond, beyond supermax institutions. And the best statistics we have are that on any given day, about 80,000 men, women, and children are held in some type of segregated housing that is chiefly characterized by isolation. You know, that is a lot of people by any measure. It's actually it's a staggering figure. And I want you to remember as we talk about solitary confinement today that this practice, the pervasiveness of it, is really a symptom of the mass incarceration that we've seen across the United States. That movement in the last 30 to 35 years where we've seen more and more people flooding into our prisons so that we now have more people in prison than any other country in the world. And that has been part of a push to get tough on crime. We've seen the severity of punishment increase. We've seen the criminalization of drug users so that our prisons are now full of drug addicts. We unfortunately have also seen the criminalization of mental illness so that our prisons and jails and juvenile detention centers are virtually the new asylums. And as I mentioned, we've seen a building spree of prisons, including supermax institutions that are solely dedicated to solitary confinement. The result is a bloated system that does not have the capacity to rehabilitate, that simply warehouses. And unfortunately, solitary confinement is an option of extreme and cruel warehousing. So let's talk a little bit about the practice in solitary confinement today in the United States. Well, the first thing to remember is it probably won't be called solitary confinement. You don't see too many corrections officials or government officials uh, using the word solitary confinement. Oftentimes, what you will hear is more noxious terms like administrative seg segregation or ad seg, a special housing unit, or a shoe, a special management unit, or a SMU, or maybe simply the whole. But regardless of what it's called, the practice is largely the same. And what we see across the United States is that folks are, are, are kept in a room that's about the size of a small bathroom. There's a picture on your screen right now, and that's kind of a typical uh, solitary confinement cell, except for you can't see the, the, uh, uh, the toilet on the, the other end that the person probably has to stand on in order to take this photo, actually. Very, very bare, very barren. This is the kind of cell you would be held in for 22, 23, 24 hours a day. It's probably a solid steel door on the other side with a food slot where you'll, you'll receive your meals, your medical care, and your mental health care. You're going to be under these conditions, which are characterized by extreme social isolation. You're not going to talk to a lot of people. And forced idleness, you're not going to have anything really to do during the day. And this amounts to the deprivation of virtually all meaningful environmental stimulation. No property, really. Maybe a few books. If you're lucky, a TV or radio, but not necessarily. And visitation is going to be extremely limited. You won't really see your family and friends very often. And those visits are always going to be no contact, meaning you are probably going to be chained down. And there's going to be a wire mesh or a window between you and your loved ones. So you're not going to be able to touch them. If you do get out of your cell, it's probably going to be a one hour, but not seven days a week, maybe five days a week if you're lucky. And you're going to be placed in a, in a cell or a cage that looks largely like the one that you live in, and that will be your recreation. I think an important thing to remember, too, is that the technological advances we've seen in terms of intercoms and video surveillance cameras have made the level of isolation that people now experience in our prisons simply unprecedented in human history. It wasn't possible before, but now it's all too common. And there's something else you need to remember about solitary confinement in the United States, and that is the length of time. Today, solitary confinement in the United States is measured not in days or hours, but months, years, and even decades. In fact, when we look at the men at the TAM Supermax in Illinois, what we found was that 25% of them had been there for a decade. Unprecedented and kind of hard to imagine, really. So who exactly is in solitary confinement? Well, the common rubric is it's the worst of the worst, uh, that, it, that it's used as a last resort for, for folks who are truly dangerous. And what I would say is that in any state, there's probably a handful of people who are dangerous and that they need to be segregated from the general population because they are a danger to themselves or more likely others. But while there's a handful, there aren't hundreds, and there certainly aren't thousands or tens of thousands. So the question remains, who, who's actually in solitary confinement? Who's filling these beds? 
when we look at the data, we see some trends. Unfortunately, there are the folks that I would, I would characterize as, as nuisance prisoners, prisoners who cause problems. They may get disciplinary infractions, but they're not necessarily violent. Oftentimes, what you'll see is folks who are charged with having extra property in their cell. Maybe they have a drug charge, or maybe they talked back to an officer, and that's what landed them in the hole. Then there's a huge contingent in these solitary confinement units are those with serious mental illness. Unfortunately, folks who have mental health issues do not do well in custodial settings. They often act out. They often don't understand prison rules. They often can't really follow them. And as a result, they end up in supermax prisons and solitary confinement units. When we look at the data nationally, it's about 30% of the population in solitary has, has mental illness. Uh, but that's rather that's on the low end. We do have systems such as Indiana, where the government will tell you about 50% of their population has a serious mental illness in their supermax prison. And what happens as a result of that is we see extreme deterioration in seriously mentally ill people kept in these units. Suicide and acts of self-mutilation are all too common. In fact, it's so well known that this is an anti-therapeutic, dangerous, debilitating environment to put seriously mentally ill folks in, that every federal court that's considered the question of whether or not placing seriously mentally ill person in solitary confinement violates our, our Constitution, the Eighth Amendment, prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment, will be found to, to be a violation, not surprisingly, and yet it's still a common practice. Then there's another contingent, the vulnerable prisoners, the folks who actually probably need some protection. For some reason or another, they are at risk. But unfortunately, all too often, they're placed in protective custody, which is the same as being placed in segregation or solitary confinement. And they, spend, they have the same experience. They spend long periods of time here. And these are the children. These are the elderly. These are the LGBTI folks people with disabilities, either physical or mental, a lot of cognitively impaired people in, in prison, and unfortunately, they do tend to end up in segregation units. And then finally, I want to flag an issue for you that's becoming more and more apparent as states are bringing forward data about people in segregation units, and that is the disproportionate minority representation in these units. In New York, for example, it was found that 59% of all individuals in disciplinary segregation in the state were African-American, despite the fact that the population in general and even the population in prison does not represent that. So these are the folks who end up in solitary confinement units. What happens to them there? Well, it's pretty well established that solitary confinement is psychologically harmful, harmful for the seriously mentally ill, but also harmful for everyone who's subject to it, unfortunately. The study the scientific research that's been done has found some fairly consistent symptoms, often called shoe syndrome. I've got a couple of them up on your screen right now. And they vary from hallucinations to irrational anger to claustrophobia, confusing thought processes, self-mutilation, lower levels of brain function, and unfortunately, suicide. In fact, nationally, about 50% of completed suicides, that means people who have actually committed suicide in our job, occur among the 2 to 8% of the population that's in isolated confinement. So clearly, there's a major problem there. Something is happening, and yet the practice is persist persistent and pervasive across the country. It seems like a grim picture, but my chief message today is that reform is possible change is possible. In the last few years, we've seen an absolute explosion of citizen action, legislative reform, public education, lit and litigation, all geared towards stopping the overuse of solitary confinement. In the state legislatures alone in the last year, in Florida, in Texas, in California, Montana, Nevada, and New York, we are seeing bills that either try to ban the practice of juvenile solitary confinement, study the practice and reveal the data so that we know what's happening in our prisons, or at least try to get the seriously mentally ill out of solitary confinement, or regulate the use of solitary confinement across the board. There's a lot of ferment going on and a lot of citizen action geared towards making it happen. I also want to say that we've had some really great successes. In January, the notorious TAM Supermax in Illinois was closed. You see on your screen a photo of a woman in Chicago thanking Governor Quinn, who made the very important political decision to close that Supermax down. It was a 10-year citizen campaign, and it was ultimately very successful. In Colorado, we saw a legislative effort 
that then morphed into an administrative reform campaign that led to a nearly 40% reduction in the number of people in solitary confinement and closed one of their supermax prisons as well as saved the state $4.5 million. And then I cannot close without talking about Maine. Uh, the state of Maine is an excellent example of a strong coalition of the faith community and the civil rights community coming together to work with the state legislature, to work with, with government officials, to work with the corrections department where there was strong leadership, to really reform practices there, reforms that actually led to a 70% reduction in the number of men in their solitary confinement unit in a very, very short period of time. And our affiliate, the Maine Civil Liberties Union, has actually written an excellent report called Change is Possible that details uh, how it happened, who was responsible, and, and gives a very good roadmap for how activists around the country can learn from that example and re replicate it in their own jurisdiction. And so I want to leave a lot of time for questions today. Uh, but I also want to make sure that you, you have access to as much information as possible. The ACLU actually has a website and a landing page called Stop Solitary. On our website, www.aclu.org, the Change is Possible report is linked there. But there are lots of more information and tools that you can use so you, too, can stand up to Stop Solitary. So I look forward to your questions. And I also look forward to hearing from our other presenters. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Amy. Next, we turn to Mr. Anthony Graves, founder of Anthony Believes. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this here. It, it's a very serious issue, and it's very personal to me because, uh, like you stated earlier, I lived 16 years in solitary confinement. Uh, I was uh, incarcerated for 18 and a half years, and I was innocent. Uh, I was given a death penalty. I was given two execution dates. And I had to deal with that all on top of being placed in solitary confinement. So it was very, very, very stressful. Uh, but fortunate for me, you know, I, and I don't know why, but I was able to maintain. Uh, that wasn't the case for a lot of guys around me. I've seen man, guys just hang themselves in their cell, not because they didn't think that they could win their case, but because of the conditions of solitary confinement was just too unbearable. Uh, I seen guys slit their wrists. I seen guys overdose on their medication. I seen guys just drop their pills and just wanted to check out because of the unbearable conditions of solitary confinement. I mean, it literally drives guys out of their mind. I, I was down there when the, I used to see a, a lot of young guys come down there, 22, 23 years old, and I would meet them. And, um, you know, I talked to them. Uh, then I wouldn't see them for a while. Uh, two years later or so, I'll run across them again. And these guys just lost all sense of touch of reality. They have totally, totally uh, broken down mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually all because of the conditions of solitary confinement. Solitary confinement is a very, very inhumane practice. Uh, I can't stress that enough because what I witness down there, I, I live with daily. You know, I when I sleep at night and my dreams are not pleasant dreams, they're dreams of solitary confinement. Uh, I deal with so uh, much of the aftermath of it all, uh, you know, with just feelings of loneliness because when you in solitary confinement you are totally isolated. So when I came out and, and I still have problems of being around large crowds of people, uh, I, I find the comfort in being alone and that's scary but that's what I've been conditioned to uh, simply because of my conditions. Um, so solitary confinement in no way, no how does any reform or rehabilitate it is only designed to do one thing, and that is to uh, break your spirit and break your will to live. And as a young man down there on Texas death row right now in solitary confinement, mentally ill, this man, the, 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 the uh, effects of solitary confinement to him was that he snatched out his eyes and swallowed them. Okay? That's how bad it was down there. This man just snatched his eye out and swallowed it. You tell me that solitary confinement is doing us any good. 
you know, the inmate of society. It is a, a punitive, uh, uh, it is a punitive, uh, how should I say, punishment. Um, there is no good in it at all. I mean, these are these are people's uh, children, That's their, their fathers, their brothers, their sisters, it's even your neighbors. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, the state has decided that because they have convicted you, they can treat you less than the person you are. They treat you worse than animals. I've never seen uh, animals being treated the way that uh, they treat you in solitary confinement because you are basically nothing other than a corpse to them. And they kick you, and they beat you, and they, they, they malnourish you. You, you. you know, the food is bad. There's just no break all the way around. You, you, you house there 23 to 24 hours a day. You might shower two, three times uh, a week. It depends on the officer because it's, you know, even though it may be the rule that you are uh, allowed to shower three times a week, it's up to the officer discretion basically because he runs wing. And if he comes in feeling like he's doing a society of favor by punishing you, then he denies you whatever little privileges you still have. The, which is uh, to take a shower, which is maybe to go out for a recreation in a bigger cell, a bigger cage for one hour, uh, you know, which is to not deny your food or give you a, a teaspoon of, of, of each of the uh, ingredients you're supposed to be having on your plate. I mean, so once you're inside a chair confinement, it, it sort of like give the uh, officers a green light to just treat you even worse. Um, so. I would say that to all those that are listening, that it, it is very important that you get involved in this process and, and, and make your voice you known against this because, you know, today you, you, you're listening to me, but tomorrow you may be your son that you're listening to or your daughter telling you about the experience of solitary confinement. And I can definitely tell you that that is not a conversation you would, you would wish to have with your child. So if you feel, you know, in your heart that this is wrong and, and, and if you look at it from a reasonable uh, personal perspective uh, in a simulated situation, you know, you, there's no way that you can uh, agree that this helps us as a society or helps the inmate in general. It is, as I say, it's deprivation. It is just a, a tool that is designed to break a man's spirit. And, uh, you know, with that, I, I turn it back over to you. Anthony, thank you Hello. so much. Thank you so much for sharing. Next, we're going to turn the conversation to uh, a look at the impact of solitary confinement for within the immigration system within the US. And for that, we turn to Emily Tucker of the Detention Watch Network. Emily? Thanks so much, Laura. And thanks to Nearcat for including me in this conversation. I feel very honored to be participating in this webinar with Amy and Anthony. So I'm going to start out with just a quick primer on what immigration detention is, because I think um, there are some misconceptions about it out there, and I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So when DHS, or the Department of Homeland Security, is trying to deport someone, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement, otherwise known as ICE, can take that person into custody and lock them up in a detention center for as long as it takes them to carry out that person's deportation. So what that means is that someone whose immigration status is in question can be living in their community, in their home, with their family, with their friends, and can be picked up by ICE at any moment, taken to a facility that's often hundreds of miles from that home, and then kept there for as long as it takes them to go through the deportation proceedings and to fight their immigration case and get their status resolved. In some cases, this can take months or even years, and there are about 33,000 people enduring immigration detention on any given day, and there are about 400,000 people who go through it every year. So a couple of misconceptions about detention. Uh, the first is it, it's not actually a crime to be in the United States without papers. It's a violation of the civil, immig civil immigration law. Immigration detention is not supposed to be, according to the Supreme Court, for the purpose of punishment. The justification of detention is just to carry out deportation. And by mentioning this, I'm not at all trying to suggest that solitary confinement or even prison itself is an appropriate way to treat people who do have criminal convictions. Far from it. 
Um, but when you go through the criminal justice system, you do have certain rights that you don't have when you're going through civil proceedings, like immigration proceedings. Um, so these include your right to a lawyer and your right to a speedy trial and the right to a bond hearing. Immigrants have none of these rights when they are put into civil immigration detention. Um, they don't. They pretty much have no due process protect, protections at all. And furthermore, because it's civil detention and not criminal detention, there are no enforceable standards governing the treatment of immigration detainees. ICE has guidelines that it publishes every year, but there's no independent oversight or monitoring of compliance with those guidelines. Um, and so I just, the absence of, of even these minimal rights and protections is important to keep in mind when we're thinking about what it means to be an immigrant in detention, and in particular what it means to be an immigrant in detention that's then subject to the additional punishment of being put into solitary confinement. So given these differences between being in civil immigration custody versus being incarcerated in the criminal justice system, you would think that immigration detention would be different from prison or jail. Um, not only is it not different, but in many cases we're talking about the vast, in the vast majority of cases we're talking about the very same facilities. Very few of the facilities that are used for immigration detention are dedicated facilities for immigrants. There's only a handful of those. The vast majority are prisons and jails and they're the same prisons and jails that house individuals with criminal convictions. So in most cases, immigrants are spending their time in solitary in the very same cells, monitored by the very same staff, going through the very same hardships that you already heard Amy describe. So how prevalent is segregation in the immigration detention context? Well, we didn't know for a long time because there's huge transparency problems at ICE. But last year, ICE, at the urging of various NGOs, did do a survey of some of its uh, facilities. They surveyed about 50 of the 250 facilities that they use, and that sounds low, but it, they actually did survey um, the most populous facilities. So I think it was accounted for about 80% of the, the detained population, and they found that there are approximately 300 immigrants in segregation every day. About half of those had spent 15 or more days in isolation, and 35 people had been held in solitary for um, more than 75 days. I just want to put in here that I think that those numbers are probably low based on my long experience of seeing how ICE underreports problems in its own facility facilities and based on my own visits to immigration detention centers where every time I go almost everybody that I speak to reports having been put into solitary for some length of time. So why does ICE use solitary? Well, the primary reason is as punishment. Um, and punishment can be for very, very minor things. So just to give you a few examples, um, at the Hampton Roads Jail in Virginia, a detainee told some of our visitors that he had been put in, se in segregation for quote unquote manufacturing wine. That was the official um, accusation. And what he had actually done was left juice in his cell um, until it had started to smell and ferment and he had been put into segregation for a week without a hearing. Um, and he had been told that he was going to be transferred back to the general population, but had no idea of when that would happen, which obviously contributed greatly to his psychological distress. Um, at York County Prison in Pennsylvania, uh, two people reported to our visitors that they were put in a segregation unit after their ID armbands fell off and they didn't notice. Um, and so there's just a whole list of Incidents I could go on for a long time about all of the very, very minor infractions that provoke the, the imposition of solitary confinement in, when you're in immigration detention. And again, remembering that because there's such poor oversight, because there are no enforceable standards, it's very hard to get accountability for these kinds of abuses. The other reason that ICE uses solitary is to supposedly protect vulnerable individuals. Um, these include people with mental illness, people who identify as LGBT, or who have other vulnerabilities. Um, you know, I, I do think that in some cases, if the choice is between being in the general detention population and being um, in one of these more isolated units, many of the LGBT folks, at least according to the organizations we work with, do prefer to be um, separated from the general population. But in a lot of cases, what the type of segregation that, that is used for those populations is far in excess of what is necessary to protect them. So you have people that are having 23 hours a day without seeing anybody or you know going outside their cell, and that's completely unnecessary for their protection. Um, and, and it is particularly troubling to see how often ICE uses solitary to segregate people with mental illness, and there are, I've just you know ex I've met people who have gone through some really harrowing, harrowing um, ordeals 
for example, in Houston, we did a report on the Houston facility last year, and I'm, we met an individual there who had been diagnosed as schizophrenic and had been in solitary on three separate occasions for final time for over three months, um, and was just, you know, he, he, was, he was obviously in need of, of serious medical help. Um, and when we reported this to ICE, they did nothing, and as far as I know, have, have still done nothing and denied the need for any specialized treatment for this individual. So really, from my point of view, people with these kinds of vulnerabilities should not be locked up in the first place. And because these are not individuals who are serving sentences for convictions, ICE does ultimately have the discretion to release them rather than spend you know, thousands of dollars to keep them behind bars and and do all of this additional damage to their mental health or physical health. Um, so if you're interested in reading more about the details of the experience of, uh, of solitary in immigration detention, I would highly recommend a report that came out last year by the National Immigra Immigrant Justice Center and Physicians for Human Rights that talks in great detail about this practice. Um, and just to close with what's happening on the advocacy front, not enough. There was a New York Times article that maybe many of you saw uh, at the beginning of the month, or maybe it was the end of March, describing the problem of solitary and immigration detention. This article prompted Senator Chuck Schumer of New York to write a letter to Janet Napolitano, who is the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, demanding that DHS reform its use of segregation and claiming that he was going to use the current immigration reform effort to change the rules on solitary and immigration legislatively if DHS didn't do something. Napolitano promised kind of vaguely to look into it. Um, I don't really know what that's going to mean. And we, the bill, the immigration bill did come out yesterday, and we were disappointed to see that there are no provisions in there specific to solitary confinement. There, there are some provisions that would do a little bit more to ensure compliance with the existing um, ICE detention standards, but it, there was nothing in there to address the problems with solitary in particular. So we'll be fighting to try to get that included through the amendment process, but that's where we are at this point. Well, Emily, thank you so much for, for joining us and for, for giving us that, that look. We want to shift now to looking at what we as people of faith can do in response. As people of faith, we, of course, recognize the inherent God-given dignity and worth of every person. And we understand that community and fellowship are essential to our faith tradition. The damage that's caused by solitary confinement, uh, as we've uh, so powerfully heard described today, uh, is, is one that is impacting thousands of people every day, both in our criminal justice system, but also family members and communities that are experience, experiencing the pain of knowing the kind of treatment that their family members are being subjected to. The faith community has been playing a crucial role in efforts to end and, and limit the use of solitary confinement in U.S. prisons. As we've heard today, momentum to halt the use of prolonged solitary confinement in U.S. prisons, jails, and detention centers continues to build nationally, with the first ever congressional hearing on the use of prolonged solitary confinement that was convened in 2012. Just after that hearing last year, the National Religious Campaign Against Torture organized a 23-hour fast to symbolize the 23 hours per day that people incarcerated in solitary confinement endure in their cells. Hundreds of people of faith nationwide joined in that fast, which was broken at a press conference following the hearing. I want to share a few ways that you can get involved today with this effort. Ending prolonged solitary confinement starts with your signature. The National Religious Campaign Against Torture has launched a national campaign to gather endorsements from people of faith for a statement calling for government officials all across the country to take steps to end the use of prolonged solitary confinement. When we reach 500 endorsers from a particular state, we send the statement along with the list of those endorsers to the state's governor top corrections official, along with every member of that state's legislature. When we reach 1,000 signatures, we send the list again, and so on, and so on. And in this way, we seek to strengthen efforts in each state to bring an end to this devastating practice. Another resource that we've made available is a 20-minute film called Solitary Confinement, Torture in Your Backyard. It's a film that's designed to be shown by houses of worship and religious organizations. 
If your faith community has an adult class that studies a variety of issues, you might consider sharing the film in that setting. The film could also work well in a college group setting, a prayer group, a prison ministry, or other social justice committee, or for an interfaith gathering. Meerkat has also prepared uh, resources to accompany uh, viewing the film, which we invite you to find on our website. Another way to take action is to reach out to members of your local media to share stories from your community. Meerkat works with faith partners around the country to support the placement of op-eds and letters to the editor um, by religious leaders in local and national newspapers in support of legislation as well as campaigns to eliminate solitary confinement and to tell the story of why we as people of faith are committed to ending torture in U.S. prisons. If you have an interest in writing or recruiting a faith leader in your community to write, uh, we would welcome hearing about that. You can email me. Uh, my address, email address is on the screen. Uh, just last week, Reverend Russell Meyer of the Florida Council of Churches was published in the Tampa Bay Times, uh, writing in favor of legislation to end the use of solitary confinement of youth in his state. So we invite you to consider adding your voice and joining your vo voice with his and so many others uh, by reaching out to, to media in your local area. I want to share a particular experience that the All Saints Church in Pasadena, California experienced, who began sending cards and notes to prisoners in solitary confinement, which may inspire you to replicate the project in your own faith community. Back in December of 2011, the parishioners of All Saints sent cards and notes to 60 inmates in the solitary confinement cells, also called the SHU, the Security Housing Unit, at Pelican Bay and Corcoran State Prison, where many prisoners had participated in hunger strikes or earlier in the year. Prisoners were invited to sign cards at the All Saints Action Table, where they had the opportunity to sign the Nearcat Statement Against Solitary Confinement, and the signing of the statement was also mentioned in the cards. A note from the priest who is the director of Peace and Justice was also enclosed in the card. And the congregation was truly overwhelmed by the amount of response that they received from prisoners. The letters have kept the issue of solitary confinement and the reality of it very much alive for its staff and its parishioners. And uh, additional opportunities for writing have been provided throughout the year. Sending cards to individuals in solitary confinement uh, can be done year-round. Uh, however, your congregation may also consider organizing a letter-writing opportunity during a particular religious holiday or to mark the UN Human Rights Day on December 10th. Guidelines for organizing a letter-writing opportunity for your faith community can also be found on our website uh, at the link provided on your screen. Around the country, the National Religious Campaign Against Torture is engaged with advocacy campaigns in partnership with state-based faith organizations focused on using organizing, public education, and legislation to bring an end to the use of solitary confinement in a number of states, including California, Illinois, Maine, New Jersey, New York, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Texas, Maryland, Louisiana, Florida, Colorado, and Virginia. If you have interest in getting involved with one of those campaigns, I would encourage you to visit our website at the link uh, listed there on your screen. One last opportunity to consider, June is Torture Awareness Month, and the National Religious Campaign Against Torture has compiled a toolkit to help congregations and religious organizations observe the month. To sign up to receive the toolkit, which we'll be making available starting April 22nd, I would encourage you to visit the link that's now appearing on your screen. We want to thank you for joining us today. Your participation is a recognition that we can't stand silently by as our sisters and brothers are impacted by prolonged solitary confinement and mass incarceration. We are committing to seek restoration and not harm equality instead of racial and economic injustice, bigotry and hatred that promotes the practice and acceptance of prolonged solitary confinement. People of faith have a critical role to play in healing the culture of torture that is allowing 
solitary confinement to continue. And so we thank you for taking the time this afternoon to join us. And we do urge you to share the stories that you've heard today with your community and to take action. Before we close, we want to take a few moments to address some of the questions that have been posed by webinar participants today. Thank you very much for um, submitting your questions. And we're going to turn to uh, Amy now for an answer to the first question. Hi, thank you so much, Laura. And there are some really great questions here. And uh, one that I noticed is a question regarding uh, the American Psychiatric Association and whether or not they recognize what we call shoe syndrome. There ha and and uh, I'll just give you a little background. The American Psychiatric Association actually publishes the, publishes the DSM, which is the manual uh, that both defines uh, and give information about mental illness in this country. It's very, very important. The American Psychiatric Association is the top, they're basically the top docs in the country, the top psychiatrists. So they have a lot of influence. And while SHU syndrome is not in the DSM, in November, uh, the APA, as it's called, came out with a very strong position statement that said solitary confinement should never be used on mentally ill individuals. And if mentally ill individuals are placed in solitary, any kind of isolation housing, special clinical supports need to be put in place uh, in order to keep them there in a humane and safe manner. And essentially what they were saying is you can't put them in solitary confinement, uh, but if there is a problem, if you need some kind of segregation, you have to ensure that they're getting the mental health care, that, they're, that they are getting interaction with clinicians and other in individuals that essentially you're not placing them in, so in solitary confinement. So that was a very, very strong statement on the, the part of the APA. But I also want you to know that the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists came out in April of last year to, and called for a ban on the solitary confinement of children. Uh, a straight ban, don't support it. Their position is that it harms children, that the developmental harm of placing kids, adolescents who are at a critical stage in their, their lives in solitary confinement is incalculable and should not be done uh, ever. So that's a very, very strong statement. Uh, I noticed also that there are a number of questions about the solitary confinement of kids. Uh, and I'm so glad people have raised that topic because it's a near and dear one to my heart in particular. There are two issues really at work here because children can experience solitary confinement in two different institutional settings. Um, there is the juvenile justice system where solitary confinement is routinely used uh, as a disciplinary form. So it's punishment. It's shorter than in the adult system, but you will still, still see kids locked down for days at a time. Uh, and so that, that in and in of itself is very, very uh, detrimental. But there's also a, a, a hidden issue that a lot of people are not aware of, and that's that a lot of children in this, this country, about 200,000 in any given year, are charged as adults. And about 100,000 of them are going to spend time in adult facilities for any given year. And unfortunately, when children are mixed with adults, they can't be kept safely. They are at enormous risk of sexual and physical abuse. And so what ends up happening is that they are placed oftentimes in solitary confinement for their own protection. But while there, they deteriorate rapidly. And the suicide rates are absolutely astronomical. The ACLU actually issued its first, the first report on this national problem called Growing Up Lockdown. It's on our website. And we have called for a ban of solitary confinement for youth across the country, regardless of what facility they are in. And unfortunately, we see, depending upon state law, you will see 13-year-olds in adult facilities. You will see 14, 15, 16, 17-year-olds in adult facilities. It varies by state. But also, unfortunately, uh, there's not a lot of transparency about this around this issue. Uh, states are not required to report when they place children in solitary confinement, so it's very difficult to find this out. Um, and we've just started uncovering this issue. We've worked a lot with Meerkat on, in Florida, in Texas, and in California uh, on legislative campaigns that will end this practice and also bring it to light because it has been so, so hidden. Amy, thanks so much. I want to direct a question uh, to Anthony. 
Uh, and again, thanks to, to all who, who sent in really thoughtful uh, and, and good questions. We're going to get to as many as we can. Uh, Anthony, someone had, had asked the question of whether folks who are in solitary confinement have rights to visitation from chaplains or outside clergy members. And I wondered if you'd be willing to speak specifically to that question from your own, from your own experience of having been in isolation for, for such a long time. Yeah, uh, well, it depends. It 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 depends uh, on the on the system itself. Uh, you have you have um, wardens that would allow uh, outside clergymen to come in and 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 uh, speak with those guys, but then you also have wardens that just they're going to refuse that. So it really depends. But for the most part, no. I mean, I, I think clergymen don't even like to go down there into the hole and talk to these guys because. Uh, you know, for whatever reason, uh, I, maybe it makes them sick to their stomach. But uh, you don't get a lot of that. You don't get a lot of interaction when you're back there with anyone. You're just back there 22, 23 hours a day by yourself. Uh, no one is coming to back there to see if, uh, if you're sane or if you're holding on. You're just back there. So I, I didn't never really see clergymen going back there and talking to guys down there in the hole to see how they were doing. Uh, what I did see is guys coming out of there after weeks of being back there, um, losing substantial amounts of weight, uh, uh, skin bad, uh, uh, deranged, uh, delusional. Um, and so I don't think that they had anyone down there uh, administering to them. So, uh, no, I, I would just say that they were, they were just put there for punishment and, and part of the punishment is you, do, you don't get to uh, you don't want to come visit you down there. And as far as visitation, well, the visitation, it becomes restricted, very, very restricted. You go from practically having, being able to have a visit every week, two hours, a day, uh, yeah, two hours every week, to basically um, maybe one visit every three months for two hours when you're back there in a uh, solitary confinement. And, and you have to basically uh, be back there for 30 days before you can get that visit, that, that first visit, and then it's like once a month or once every two months, depending on the situation. Uh, so what I have done, you know, what Anthony believes, if you go online, I've, I've started a petition, and I've created some, some wristbands, and, and I've challenged 10 million people around the world to get these wristbands and to sign this petition this petition and, uh, you know, standing up with me to be an advocate for the voiceless, which is those guys that are back there that are suffering that you cannot hear. And I want to take that petition as we sign it, and I want to send it to the governor and, and, I, I, <clears throat> and let him know that people are concerned about this because me personally, I witness things that are still my nightmare, which is uh, solitary confinement. Anthony, thanks so much. I want to send a question that we just received to, to Amy, and it's asking, uh, we've, we've heard a, a, a bit about the experience of men in solitary confinement, and uh, someone wondering uh, if women are also placed in solitary confinement, and if you could speak to that. Thank you, Laura. That, that's a very good question. Yes, women are subject to solitary confinement in our criminal justice system. They are not there in the same numbers as men. Uh, but for women who are incarcerated, solitary confinement is used for discipline, it's used for protection, it's used as an administrative status, it's used if you're suicidal. And for women, there's an extra layer that you have to consider about solitary confinement because the women in the criminal justice system, even more than men, come in with histories of sexual abuse and trauma. They have extremely high rates of serious mental illness. And so when they are placed in solitary confinement, you're almost guaranteeing a greater impact for those women. And there's another angle that we absolutely have to consider with women and is, that is too often ignored uh, when criminal justice policies are formulated, and that's the role of, of women as mothers. Uh, it's bad enough when you are in prison and you can't really visit with your children and you can't be part of their lives, but in solitary confinement, when you're never ever going to be able to touch your child, the devastating impact that it has on the woman, but the, also the additional devastating impact that it has on her children, that may be lifelong and is so unnecessary. 
so this is a, a growing concern. Too often, women are hidden and ignored in the criminal justice system. In fact, in one of our cases in Arizona that we have, it's a statewide case about solitary confinement that includes women. We talked to one state official who you know, told us, don't worry, don't worry. Uh, we are fixing the problem. We are going to provide mental health programming for individuals in isolation. And then when he, we asked about the women, he said, oh, well, I, I forgot about them. And that is too often the attitude that we see. So remember the women, consider what's happening to them, and advocate that they, too, are not placed in solitary confinement, that there are better options. Thank you, Amy. Uh, I'm going to turn to a question we received from an attendee uh, saying, Nearcat's statement against solitary confinement, where would I find this on the website? And have you seen it have a significant impact on legislators' opinions on the issue? So first, for finding it, um, the statement is available on our website. If you go to www.nrcat.org backslash stop solitary. Again, that's www.nrcat.org backslash stop solitary. And to the, the deeper question of how we've seen uh, signing this statement impact legislators' opinions on the issue, we really can't state enough the impact of, of signing and sharing the statement and then being able to bring the statement before our state legislators. Uh, most recently, NearCat delivered a statement to uh, the governor's office in New York late last year after a 1,000 signatures were collected there. Uh, the coalition has seen um, both the ability to uh, engage in visitations to facilities, uh, is engaged in ongoing conversation with Department of Corrections officials. Um, the, the statement itself allows us to communicate to our elected officials and to Department of Corrections officials that this indeed is an issue of deep concern for the faith community. It communicates that we're paying attention, uh, that constituents are, are deeply concerned that this practice is happening on, and ongoing. We saw certainly in campaigns such as the, the one in Maine that Amy spoke to before that uh, the, the presence of the faith community being organized and being at the table um, to share about our deep concern to see this, to see this practice come to an end uh, has had significant impact. So uh, indeed, uh, it, it does have impact. I want to encourage you to, um, to sign the statement to encourage folks in your faith community to do the same. And let's get to 500 signatures in your state, and we'll we'll do a delivery together and see what see what see where the campaign goes from there. Hi, this is Amy again, and I've just been told about a couple questions that I would love to to address. Uh, first, there's been a question about well, how long can someone be pre-trial held in solitary confinement? And remember, pre-trial means you haven't been convicted and you are presumed innocent until found guilty, but you have to. Oftentimes, folks will be stuck in jail, and this especially happens with children. Uh, the majority of kids in adult facilities are spending a lot of time pre-trial. Uh, and the short answer is there's really no limit. Uh, you can be held from day one until you're either uh, convicted and sent to prison or you are found innocent and sent home. Uh, in fact, the vast majority of kids who are actually being held in adult jails, uh, they never, never are sent to prison, actually, because, quite frankly, oftentimes what will end up happening is they will get probation or they will get time served. And so that tells us they're spending needless time in solitary confinement uh, that they probably could have been spending at home or in the juvenile justice system because the crimes they were charged with were really not as serious as we would have thought. So no limits. A lot of people are held pretrial in solitary confinement, especially amongst those vulnerable populations. And then we've heard from some parents who have had personal experiences with their children being held in county jails and prisons in solitary confinement, oftentimes with histories of mental health issues, histories of substance abuse, all indications that solitary confinement is potentially 
very damaging for them. And what I will say is that it is important that you, you know this, and it is important that you contact the facility, reach out, write letters, make calls. Uh, the best thing that you can do is to ensure that the prison officials or the jail officials know that you're out there, that your son or daughter has loved ones who care about him or her, and that you're watching what happens to them, and that you will hold them accountable. Uh, I know it's tough. Uh, it's a horrible situation to be in. But visiting, making your presence known, being a strong advocate for your child is the most important thing you can do. Amy, thank you so much. We uh, want to say a special thanks to all of you for joining us. And uh, in conclusion, I want to ask Anthony our, our last question, uh, which is if, if there was one, one thing that uh, you want folks who are on the line today to walk away and remember, uh, what would it be? Uh, could you please repeat that? My phone was breaking up. Sure. Uh, I was just saying, uh, what, what is the one thing uh, that you would hope if, if folks, when they walk away from the call today, the thing that they would most remember uh, and do? Well, you know, when they walk away today, what I want them to rem remember is that those men and women behind bars are someone's mother, father, son, brother, sister, that someone's uh, uh, that someone that that that's been that's loved by a family, and uh, I it's an inhumane situation, and it's not necessary. There are many other ways to get to whatever the outcome it is that they're trying to reach, but it's not through punishment like these this uh, insane inhumane. Uh, punishment that they have going on now. So I would, well, I would want people to understand that this could be you. This could definitely be you. Because you was once a child. Well, we have children behind solitary. Well, you're, you're a grown person, so we have grown people behind solitary. And this is a runaway train. It is so bad that, you know, it, it, it's taken outside influence to try to make a difference. That's how bad it is. Well, out, external influence has external External people have to get involved, and, and uh, I say that, look, we deserve better. We are human beings, and we should be treated humanly all the way across the board. Whether you made one mistake in life or ten mistakes in life, you're someone's family member. You are a member of the human race, and we should always remember that. And we should not allow our system to become the criminal why trying to prosecute a criminal. I say, you know, just just ask yourself, ask yourself, you know, could I deal with that? And I think when you come to the conclusion that no, there's no way you can deal with that, then you know the right thing to do, which is to get involved, sign these petitions, call your, your legislatures, and let your voices be heard by telling them this this solitary confinement is not necessary. Those people are our loved ones, and they are human beings. Please stop the madness. That's what I would ask, and that's what I would hope that you all would take away from this. Thank you, Anthony, for a powerful word. Uh, we want to let folks know that the session today has been recorded, and we will be making it available both on our website and emailing it out uh, to all of you uh, after the session today. We encourage you to, to share it widely. A special thanks to each of our presenters and to each of you for being a part of this gathering today. Thanks so much.